Great. Um, so as was just said, I'm Matthijs. Um, I'm a PhD student at the Software Languages Lab right here at the VUB. Um, and since I seem to be a fan of overly long titles, I'll just dive right into my presentation. Right. Um, so as a part of my research, I'm interested in this thing called the data flow model. Um, and the data flow model has some nice properties, like a data-driven style of execution and a lack of global memory. And the combination of these factors make it possible to execute programs written in this model in an implicitly parallel style. Now, I want to use this model to actually experiment with programming language design and implementations. So in order to make that possible, I want to have a flexible and a really extensible virtual machine so I can well, run these experiments and then I can actually implement some language features. Now, as far as I know, there is no VM out there uh, today that allows me to actually do this. So I decided to build my own and that's what I'll be talking about in the next um, 14 minutes or so. Right. Uh, so before I dive into that, I should probably tell you what this data flow model is all about. So the main idea behind the data flow model is that any program can rep be represented as a graph. Um, every operation in this graph is a node, and um, edges between the nodes represent the data dependencies between operations. So we can see both of our minus um, operations here are represented as nodes in the graph, and since the output of this minus is sent to the square, there's obviously also a data dependency present in the graph. Um, if we actually want to execute this program, then we can just add the program data to this graph. And now the interesting thing about the data flow model is that it says that as long as one operation has all of its inputs, you can execute an operation. So we can see that both of our minus nodes here have all their inputs, so they can just be executed. Um, and since the model doesn't impose any ordering besides data dependencies, this can potentially be done in parallel. All right? Um, for simplicity's sake, however, I'll just stick to executing this top minus here. So what happens when I execute this, I consume both of my inputs and I produce a new output, of course. So I, um, I consume the 5 and the 2 um, and I get a tree as a result, which is sent along to the next operation in my graph. This, gra this node can now also be triggered because it has all of its inputs and of course we can consume our token again and produce a new output token. Um, this can of course continue once this minus triggers here, then this square can be triggered, then this plus will have all of its inputs and then we can execute the square root and we will have the result. Um, of our program. So the main idea behind this model is that any operation can be triggered when all of its inputs are present. Um, so this is actually only the theoretical data flow model. In practice there are a few different implementations out there um, and the one that I'm interested in and the one that I'm, be, I'll, well, that I'm currently talking about is the stack token data flow model and the idea behind this model is that um, every token, well that you add a color to every token and this color can be added, uh, can be used by the runtime to um, identify different execution contexts. Um, so examples of execution contexts include, for instance, function invocations or um, separate iterations of a parallel loop. So for instance, if we look at this code here, we call our distance functions uh, function two times. Um, and what could happen without this coloring system is that both of the tokens arrive in this part of the graph at the same time, which should obviously be problematic because then your runtime wouldn't know which token belongs to what. So with this entire coloring system, we know that all these tokens belong together and that all these tokens belong together and now the runtime can correctly execute your program. <coughs> okay, um, so once again that's pretty abstract. So um, if we want to implement this, how would we do this? Um, we start to implement this by creating something called a token. Um, and a token is an abstraction, well, you wrap your input of your program inside these tokens. Um, a token consists of two parts. The first part is the datum, which represents your program data that you're wrapping around. Um, and the second part is called a tag. Now, um, this tag is actually the metadata that your runtime needs to correctly execute your program. Um, it consists of three parts. The first one is the operation address. So this is just an identifier of uh, one particular node in your program graph. So for instance, this could be the address of a particular minus node. Then there's the port. The port identifies which input a specific token is. So for instance, to go back to my minus example, a minus has two inputs, of course, the left-hand side and right-hand side. Um, this port tells you if it is the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the operation. Finally, you have the context. And this context actually corresponds to this color that I've mentioned in this slide here. So this context is a unique identifier for a specific execution context. Okay, um, so if I want to build a tag token data flow VM, um, then I basically create a pipeline that does nothing besides um, consuming and, and processing these tokens all day long. 
Um, a naive version of such a pipeline would look something like this, and it consists of four um, separate components. Um, the first one is just the token queue. It contains all of the tokens which are ready to be processed. That's fairly uh, simple. Um, once such a token will be processed, we add it to the matching memory. Now this matching memory is a piece of memory which contains the partial invocations for every operation in your program. So here you can see that for this particular operation we already have one input and for the same operation but with a different context we also only have one input. Right, now if another input gets added to this memory, for instance if this slot here would get filled, then this matching memory will ensure that this operation here will get executed. This is done by the next step in the pipeline, um, the execution unit. And this execution unit is responsible um, for applying the operations to the program data. So for instance, let's say that I call the, um, that I will execute my minus operation with two tokens, one containing a tree, one containing a five. This execution unit will grab the data out of these tokens, so the tree and the five. It will apply the minus operation to this tree and to this five, and it will produce a datum which is of course two. Okay? This two will be passed to the final component of our pipeline, which I called the tokenizer. And this tokenizer will simply wrap this um, datum inside a token, which will be added to your token queue. And the tokenizer will ensure that your, um, all of this metadata here is actually correct to ensure that your program is actually executed correctly. Okay, so this tokenizer handles your context logic and also your destination. Now, all of this suffices when we want to um, execute simple programs that only contain things like a plus and a minus and things like that. But we get into trouble when we add, want to add something that's slightly more fancy. We even get into trouble when we just want to um, implement a conditional or a function call um, or something like that. And this is a case because we cannot, um, because we cannot express these um, sorts of special cases in terms of simple data to data mapping. So for instance, if we would have to um, implement a function call or something, then we would need to modify two components of our pipeline. We would need to modify our execution unit, and we would also need to modify this tokenizer thing that I've just mentioned. So, um, this issue is actually caused by the fact that your instruction set in our naive VM is actually built directly on top of our processing pipeline. So, if you want to add something that's slightly more fancy than just mapping data to data, you have to add, um, you have to wake into the guts of your VM, and that's obviously horrendous if you want to actually create ex add extra features to your language. Right, so I've tried to solve this problem, and that's what I'll be talking about, of course. So I tried to solve this problem by creating my own um, stack. Um, and in my system, I provide you with the processing um, pipeline, which processes tokens for you. And you have to implement your own operations. So you, as a language designer, have to implement your own operations in terms of some semantics that I offer you that I will um, talk about later. Then you can implement your own instruction set on your operations. Um, and the nice part is that now we can completely separate this processing logic from the logic of implementing operations. Um, how do you implement such an operation? Well, you do this by simply writing a function. This function will accept a bunch of tokens, which is just the input data to that particular operation, and a few runtime components that I will get into in the following few slides. And the idea is that your um, function will also return a bunch of tokens itself, these tokens will get added to the token queue, which means that in my design there is no uh, need for a tokenizer because you're actually handling that logic yourself. So, in the next few slides, I'll actually show you how you can use these features because I'm guessing this is really vague right now. I'll show you how, can, how you can use these features and I'm going to do that by implementing a function call in terms of these things. Right, um, so every function call has a few components that we'll look into. Our goal is to get some input data here, which will be sent to our function body, of course. And at the end, when we get our output data, we want to send this back to a return site which is specified by the caller, so which is not known by the callee at uh, the compile time. Okay, so let's execute our call here. Um, our, car will, our call will simply um, receive two tokens, and now we want to send these to the function body. However, we have to send these tokens to the function body inside of a new context. Why do we have to send this inside of a new context? Because some other piece of our program can be calling the same function. So if these tokens are not wrapped inside of a new context, then our tokens would get intermingled um, and the execution of our program um, would be well, in trouble. 
So I can uh, create a new context by using one of these runtime components that I've mentioned, which is called the context manager. And I will just add, ask the context manager to create me a new context. Okay, now I have a new context and I know what data I need to send to which location, to the function body. So what do I do? I just create a bunch of new tokens and I will send these tokens to the function body with the new context which I will, um, oh, which is shown by the yellow color here. So this is possible because in my runtime system you can simply create tokens which are um, sent to an arbitrary destination with an arbitrary context. So I can just grab the context that I, grabbed from the, that I got from the context manager and create tokens with this context that are sent to this location. You can see that I'm also sending two other tokens here. Um, and these tokens actually um, contain the metadata that I need to properly return from my function later on. So I'm sending the context that this operation here was called, was invoked with, and I'm also sending the return address, so that is actually the operation address of this return site here. Um, I can do this because in my system I can represent any piece of data that you normally capture in a tag as a first class value which you can wrap inside the data. So this means that you can easily set operation addresses, ports, and these contexts around. Okay, so I'll use this shortly. So while my function body is um, processing some tokens, performing pluses and minuses or whatever, um, this operation here will store the proper return data so we can actually return from our function directly later on. Um, we can do this by accessing a piece of memory which is called the context memory. And this context memory is just a simple key value store which is local to the current context. So I can only access this specific key value store from within the yellow context. And now I can use this context memory to just store this return context and this return address. Okay, um, after some additional processing, I will arrive at my return instruction. So I will need to send this result here to my return site. How do I do this? First of all, I need to know what the address of my return site is and with which context I need to return. I can do this by just asking my context memory for this data that I just inserted in the store return data operation here. And after that, I know which context I need to return to and I also know which location I need to return to. So what can I do now? Since I can create tokens with arbitrary um, destinations and arbitrary context, <coughs> I can simply send the token to the return site with the original context here, which will ensure that my um, execution will, co um, will continue correctly at this point. The only thing I need to do at this point is clean up after myself. So I will use this context manager again to destroy the context that I'm currently executing in as a form of a cleanup site. Okay, so to recap, I used the runtime components that I've mentioned a few times to implement a function call. Um, and I've done this by first creating a new context when I received my tokens here, so I created a new context. Then I sent this input data to my function body with this new context. Um, I've stored my data that I need to properly return from my function with this operation here. Finally, when I arrived at my return um, instruction, I retrieved this data from my context memory and I used it to go back to my return site and I just cleaned up after myself. So to look at the big picture again, when you um, create an operation in my um, system, you can define it in terms of these four things. So first of all, you receive a bunch of tokens and you can create your own tokens in turn. So this allows you to send data to arbitrary program locations with an arbitrary execution context. Um, so this means that for instance, you can uh, just create a conditional by sending something to an arbitrary location. Uh, I didn't get go into this, but you also get read-only access to um, the matching memory of your current context. So this captures the execution state um, of your current uh, of your current context, which I want to use or I want to experiment with this later on to implement features like closures. Next, I can use this context manager to create context at any time. So I can use this to um, make any piece of my program graph read entrant because I can just create a context. Later on, I can also use this to destroy my current context as a cleanup operation. Finally, I have this context memory, and this context memory is just a key value store that I can use um, to add some metadata to my context. So, to wrap things up, I created sort of a build your own tag token data flow virtual machine, and I've done that by separating this token processing logic from the logic of implementing your own operations. Um, and I did this in such a way that contexts are completely separated from one another. So this means that I do not violate the semantics of my tag token model, and it also means that I um, can still get the implicit parallelism that the data flow model actually offers me. Um, 
and that's pretty much all I have for you. So if you have any questions, let me hear you go. Questions? Can I ask one? So why exactly do we want to take token data flow? Can you expand a little bit on what they are useful for? And so what kind of workloads do you think yeah. are particularly good for? Um, so the main issue with, with data flow models in general is that you need a lot of parallelism to actually get the benefit from them. So uh, personally, I'm looking at situations where you're pushing a lot of data through the same pipeline. So you have data that you want to process in parallel, and you're pushing these through the same pipeline. And that's what I want to do with this implicitly parallel execution semantics. So with some sort of data analytics, or basically yes. Because um, oh, Jack, go ahead. Well, I was just saying, people did this in hardware in the 70s and 80s, didn't they? Yes. Um, so what, what's the advantage of doing it inside the VM? Uh, well, I cannot access the hardware in the first place, and I do not have the expertise to build my own hardware, so I think that's the practical concern there. I also think that it's nice to be able to experiment uh, by just doing weird stuff like this, which is also something that you just cannot do uh, by implementing it in hardware. So, Mario, why are we already to tap token data flow machines these days? Because uh, they're slow. Because they're slow, right, okay. <coughs> because the token oh, transfer. Well, there's all this overhead of matching stores. Yeah, it's a massive vandal version. Oh, so, oh, sorry, so I, I, I was in Manchester in the 80s. I'd, I'll bet any number of Belgian beers that I'm the only person in the room who's actually programmed a data flow machine. I the only person in the country who's programmed that. So, but it's, you know, that kind of died a long time ago. So, I, so what kind of languages do you think? And why this implementation approach rather than a more traditional kind of like is it? Yeah. Implementation so, besides being crazy enough to build my own data flow machine as the only person in Belgium, I was also crazy enough to do things bottom up, so by starting with my VM design. Um, uh, to answer a bunch of questions at once, um, the reason, wait, um, so the reason I actually started with this was to um, address your question. There is indeed a, an enormous amount of overhead that you need to tackle when you're constantly matching these tokens. Uh, and the idea actually came when I thought, okay, you're matching these tokens, you're dealing with these contexts, you're doing all of this fancy stuff, but you're locking it inside of the black box and you're not letting your programmer access these things. So I think if you're if you're gonna deal if you're gonna have to deal with this logic anyway, but that's if you already assume that you want a data flow virtual machine. If you're going to have to implement all this stuff anyway, and if you have to deal with all of the overhead that this um, gives you, then you might as well get something useful out of it. So that was actually the main idea behind this, that you're dealing with all of this overhead, so you can actually just use it for something useful, um, and actually use these concepts as a first class sort of citizen. So it's somehow an introspective data for our detection. Yes. Um, so I have a more of a comment, I guess. So when I, when I started talking about this, that sort of brought to my mind some of the graph uh, analytics uh, systems that seem to have sort of operate on a similar principle, which is that you have nodes and you have input to the nodes. There's an application in the nodes that it gets executed when the input is available and gets propagated uh, further to, to other nodes. And one of the examples of such systems is Craig, actually, uh, built it number of years ago Google, but not, not like 20 years ago, but like six or seven. Can you repeat it? Pregel. Pregel. P-R-E-G-E-L. And it's been used at Google, I think, for, for graph analytics. Uh, anybody from Google care to comment? Somebody? Somebody from Google? Uh, so I was wondering if you look into these systems that are clearly more specialized than your uh, very generic uh, solution where you can you know, write sort of very generic code, but perhaps there are some tricks that they use, because they have to, I mean, this is massive amounts of data uh, for graph processing that they have to deal with. Maybe there are some tricks or, or ideas there that could be useful and, and sort of could generalize to uh, a more general solution. I haven't looked into them, so I cannot really answer your question, but I... But that's why I said, it's not really a question, it's a, it's a comment or a suggestion. So I'd suggest looking at, it's, I think, again, I forgot what was the name of the programming model that, that they called it, but Pregel is definitely, and there was a paper from Google again, six or seven years ago, uh, on this, so that's a good starting point if you if you care to look at these kinds of uh, systems. Uh, sorry, but it's a remark on the previous talk. 
uh, I, uh, I have a compiler for JavaScript to the GPU, but for a UI style, and I do a talk about it tomorrow, so just to hook into uh, the interest in compiling dynamic languages to GPU, uh, if anybody's interested, tomorrow at 3.30, uh, it's called the live programming talk in Kokodo, so. Oh. so sorry, Art, there does not meant to be like that. Um, I just want to uh, one thing. So, have you thought about? I mean, my understanding is you basically have that virtual machine abstract for basic primitive things. Have you thought about like increasing the granularity? Mm -hmm. So instead of uh, having really operations on primitive data types, having operations on chunks of data instead. Yeah, that's uh, that's actually the context that I want to use this these things in because indeed, since you're having so much overhead, you do not want to use this in example where you actually have this entire logic for just a single minus because then the overhead becomes so large um, so I'll probably apply it to more workflow like systems where it's not as bad that you want to well, where it's not as bad to pay all this overhead per operation because your operations are so large anyway but I thought that for the sake of this talk it was simpler to stick to just something like a minus and a plus that everybody knows. Go ahead. So you seem to have like build on top Kind of something that looks to me like a simple message passing, basic building block. Did you uh, ever think about building a distributed uh, like system out of that? Because that, that seems like the overhead there could... So I want to actually build a distributed system, and the entire reason that I, that I was um, so adamant about keeping these contexts separate is because if, it's, if the context is completely standalone, then you can easily just move it to a new machine. And then, of course, you, you run into the granularity problem again. If your granularity is coarse enough, then you can just say, okay, I'll move this context to this machine. It will execute there, and at some point, I'll get something useful from it. So, as far as I know, you can, you should just be able to trivially say this context goes to this machine now, and then you have your distribution, well, not for free, but you don't have to worry too much about it. So, a bit of a like, plug in here. So, we do have a poster on distributed directive programming, which is actually somewhat quite similar. You may want to take a look at that. And that's right now, right? Yeah. I'll definitely pass by. Okay. How much is still centralized though if you distribute everything? Because you still have your management kind of layer on top. Um, I've presented this as like a sort of a sequential version of the model because I only have one pipeline here. But actually, if you, if you want to implement this in a parallel way, you just have, for every core, you just have one of these pipelines. And then the tricky part become, uh, becomes making sure that your contexts are at the correct location. But once you can guarantee that, you have zero centralized um, processing. Which is why this model is so nice, because you don't have any global memory, and you just have everything separated by context, so you can say, okay, I'll execute this on that machine, I'll execute this on this core, I'll execute this on this core. But of course you have all of the overheads that you need to pay to actually be able to achieve that. Any more questions? Well, let's thank you again.